right, Mr. Ben White, Treasurer of uh, WA, thanks so much for joining us on Happiness 8. Pleasure, Robbie. Pleasure. Now, uh, I'm, I'll be honest, I'm a little bit uh, starstruck um, <laughs> because uh, every time we get to catch up with you, it's, uh, it's awesome. I see uh, the passion that you bring to the job um, and uh, I just want to sort of lead out by saying you guys have done an incredible job as a government in the last uh, few months, which I'm sure everyone would agree with. What's it been like for you personally? It's been an incredible six months. It feels like five years. You know, COVID time seems to stretch. Uh, but it, it's been something that I never thought I'd have to experience and didn't want to experience. But uh, the government and the, all the government agencies, I think, really stepped up mm. to, to make decisions we never thought we'd have to make around literally closing the economy down yeah. as as we had to fight this virus. But I think Western Australians, Australia, but Western Australians in particular, I think, showed a really incredible discipline. Uh, and as a result, in March, I was thinking we we're gonna to have to have things closed until through to September. Yeah. And here we are now in, in June, where the most advanced of all the states of having our economy reopened. Uh, and people, I think, are really um, happy that we've managed to effectively eliminate the virus. It's incredible to think of. And I was saying today to a couple of different people that we are just so lucky to live in this, yeah. uh, obviously being the most isolated city in the biggest state away from uh, a lot of different populations. But even then, it was never going to be easy and it's just been done so beautifully. And yeah. I think it's a credit to, yeah, like I said, the government and the people. Yeah, absolutely. And it's we have. I mean, our distance is really been a huge advantage. That Malibu, I love that Malibu <laughs> plane. There's yeah. long distance between us and the rest of the country. <laughs> um, it has been really good, but you know, people took it seriously. You know, mm. they stayed home, they social distanced, they washed their hands, all the things that we asked them to do. But then, you know, without much complaint, when we said we have to close cafes and restaurants and pubs, you know, that has an impact on jobs, mm. you know, people did it. And beers um, with the boys. And business you know? boys gone, you know, all done. But it's here we are on the other, getting on the other side now, and so it's good to see people getting back into work and back into sort of what is going to be a normal life until we get a virus. A um, new normal. To until we get a vaccine That's for this virus, yeah. Yeah. Now it's uh, yeah. I, I've just been blown away with the uh, the support of the public, and um, obviously. Um, the Premier's got the highest support rate yeah. I've ever seen in my yeah, life. Incredible. Mr. Mr. 89%, <laughs> which is awesome. Um, but just to sort of rewind a little bit, I wanted to ask you what motivated you to get into public office because, I mean, we were just chatting before about a few different uh, yeah. aspects of what it, what it brings to your life in terms of pressure. Uh, what, made it, motiv what motivated you initially? Yeah, it's, I grew up in a house with both mum and dad were teachers and then dad got into the... Um, uh, public service in Commonwealth Aboriginal Affairs and then State Government Aboriginal Affairs. And so I grew up in a very, I guess, politically aware and a politically active house yeah. um, where uh, public service was a big part of life. So I grew up interested in public policy, you know, the role of government and uh, what governments can and can't do to help, it, all those things. And so I was always interested yeah. in, in, yeah. In, the, in the topic. Um, and so I was always hoping at some point to get a chance to stand for Parliament. Um, and then I got incredibly, you know, the combination of right place, right time and luck, mm. I suspect. When Jeff Gallup retired here in Victoria Park back in 2006, I was lucky to get the Labor Party pre-selection and then win the election. Uh, and that was, yeah, you know, what's that now, 14 years ago. Um, and it is, I would never have a job like this. You yeah, know, it's, yeah. I got elected young. I was 31 when I was elected. Yeah, um, incredibly. Which is incredibly young. Yeah. yeah. So... Um, eventually I'll be out and do something else, but it's I'll never have a job like this where mm. it's just every day is exciting, dynamic. Yeah, it's stressful, yes, but it, it is the most diverse job I'll ever have. And there is, it's a real, a real reward. Yeah. I, some really good things. I can only imagine that, that you, to see something through from day one to day done uh, yeah. must be incredible. It is brilliant. It is great. And being in government is wonderful because you make decisions that uh, have a positive impact on people and... Uh, and on the economy and on the state, and that's what that's what it's all about. Yeah. To the positive side of things, first, uh, what's the most enjoyable part about the job? The um, the most enjoyable part, and un I guess, unsurprising, because if you're getting getting into public life, it's about people. Mm. Is that is getting the chance to travel around this state and just meet incredible people doing incredible things. Yeah, and most people do things that they don't they don't sing about it. They don't scream it from the from the rooftops they're just doing things and it's just amazing whether it be a tiny little tourism outfit mm. uh, just employing a couple of local people through to uh, you know the large corporations through to people at home with their business doing it. it's really 
amazing what people do and also how people respond sometimes to the toughest of circumstances to you know to create an incredible life so um it's about the people stories that you that i think every politician will find the most interesting as yeah part of it. there must be a, a whole element of resilience that you see that lives underneath the sort of public resilience if you like so that that smaller time resilience where you know what they've been through, you get the context, and then you get to see them come out the other side. That's a great comment. You're exactly right. Every day I'll come across somebody who has had you know, a tough life, you know, mm. really tough. I mean, I was lucky. I had you know, loving parents um, you know, that really valued education, spent a lot of money and effort on my education. And, you had, mm. and I see people all the time who just didn't have that opportunity but have you know, uh, come to a position in life through their own hard work and their own set of values that... Um, I mean they're now making a great contribution to life and it's it's amazing to think you know really I had it easy compared to so many people who are doing great things. Mm. Whereabouts did you grow up? So up until year five I was in the gold fields. Yeah nice. Uh, out in Kalgoorlie and Laverton and then dad uh, dad transferred from the Commonwealth Government to the State Government and moved to Perth. Gotcha. So um, moved up here when I was in year five so I was at 10, 11 years old. Yeah nice. Well you're a does that make you a country kid or a city? Yeah, kid? well, well, <laughs> funny you should ask that because I keep saying to my two girls who are now 10 and 11, yep. all their life they've lived in here in Victoria Park, which is a lovely place to live. Represent. It's fantastic. <laughs> Absolutely. So I say to my girls, I really would hope at some point to get a chance to live in regional WA with them because yep. it just brings a different perspective on life. I think the things I got up to as a kid, and there's no way I'd let my two do, <laughs> do, do what I was getting up to at that age. Yep. <laughs> but it did give me a sense of independence and confidence that I think um, only regional WA can give you. It's just such a different vibe, isn't it? Yeah. And I know that's yeah. a, that's like, you know, it's the bit of the castle, but it is, it's a vibe yeah. thing where you've Absolutely. got, um, I mean, that, that, you know, when the lampposts come on, time to come home kind yeah. of situation, but probably didn't even have the lamppost. <laughs> no, I sort of think back now, we'd get on the bikes in the morning and yeah, we'd be coming home well after dark. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking now if my kids did that, my gosh, you know, you'd be just Probably traumatized. Be on the search yeah, you'd yeah. be calling the police. Where are they? <laughs> um, I suppose that leads into the, the the next question I had, which was, how have you seen? I, I guess from a, a a view that you have as treasurer and as a member of um, this great parliament, seeing the change the change in the state over those fourteen, I think you said years, but yeah. more so over these last few years. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Um, being in government and, and getting that view. How, how have you seen it change for the positive? Would be? I think I think the state is just growing in confidence, and confidence in its own place, not just in our Commonwealth of Australia, mm. but where we sit on the Indian Ocean um, looking up into Asia. I um, The good thing about government is, particularly in Treasury, you get... Um, you very much get an international perspective yeah. because we borrow our money from all over the world. Of so course. you're forever meeting with bankers and super funds who buy our debt. Um, and so you get a good perspective on things. Uh, I think Western Australia now, because we're such a big export state, not just iron ore, we're all familiar with that, but yep. um, uh, education, tourism, health services, yeah. we are very much, and half of our population growth normally, not at the moment, but normally comes from international migration. So mm. we're, we are quite a multicultural so international city and, and state. So I think that confidence... Um, that we have as a state has grown incredibly over the last decade. And you just feel that. You yeah. Feel do, that. do we do we bat above our average a bit here in WA? At, at, at every level. Yeah. yeah, at every level. I think and I think that is um, there's a sense now of, you know what, this what this coronavirus showed is that the mining sector in particular really um, underwrote a sense of um, a rigor to our economy that mm. the rest of the states really benefited from. Of course. And that's from the efforts of Western Australia. <laughs> we won't so delve I think too much a, into that. We yeah. know that in the West, but I think now on the East Coast is a greater sense of what Western Australia provides. And I sometimes, when I'm on the East Coast, get a sense that people just have a view of the West as, you know, the Wild West, those yep. sort of cowboys. Yep. But now I think there's a much greater uh, appreciation of what we do over here and the fact that. More often, not the Western Australians look north. We don't look east. Yeah, of course, yeah. And I think the the whole result of COVID, to me, is if, if you were to summate it positively, of course, is that sense of gratitude, appreciation, and not taking certain things for granted. Yeah. So it's funny that you, you sort of allude to the fact that the state as a, as a whole was being taken for granted. Absolutely. And there's been a bit of time, you know. we Despite all the, the trauma that responding to this virus has sort of you know brought on the economy... I think one of the great reflections I get from people is they've had this few weeks there where 
you weren't going out. Mm. Um, you couldn't really go out. You couldn't travel. Yep. So people were sort of staying at home. And I think it's just brought a sense of reflection to, to life, but also you know, perspective on the state, perspective on their own jobs and perspective on where we sit. Yep. Um, could, because we've watched the rest of the world deal with this coronavirus. And to be honest, countries that we would have thought would be really good at it have been terrible at it. Uh, but Australia, we, we've, we, I think we've been the best in the world at it. Yeah, I, I think the, uh, the people obviously play a big part in that, but it's got to have great governance. And I think that comes from um, people taking ownership that there is an issue, obviously. Yeah. Is that the best way to put it? Yeah, but people did take an ownership. Mm. They, took, they said, right, well, we need to make our own decisions about restricting our activity to stop this spread. Um, but what it also showed is, you know, this huge investment that we've done in Western Australia for decades into our public health system, yeah. into our education system, it really stepped up. Yeah, it starts it stepped to, up. this is the proof in the pudding. That's right. This is a huge investment that uh, we make as a, as a community uh, and it paid off, I think. And you look, you know, I think America, it's a terrible, terribly sad story. We don't have the, mm. um, a strong public health system, um, not being able to handle what came at it, whereas here in Western Australia, we, we, we reacted, and Australia, we reacted well, we, re, we reacted with discipline and care for each other, yep. and we um, stopped the spread, and as a result, we're in a really good position now. Compassion is just the key to, to most things, right? Yeah, I mean, people, people change their own behaviour, and you look at this, and this will be um, probably the greatest loss in wealth in terms of the economy in my lifetime mm. because of deliberate decisions that we had to make because we didn't want people to get sick. Yeah, it's really such quite a, an interesting... Such an interesting... Yeah, it really um, is interesting. Almost like an alternate universe in a way that... that and there'll be you know books written about this for yeah. you know, the next 20 years, um, but that's what motivated our decisions of our community. It's about protecting each other, and we did it. So, obviously, with all the pressures that have come, and, and whether it's personal work, uh, COVID-related, how do you personally um, keep yourself grounded and... and, and control that within yourself yeah um i like to well i mean i like to go for, i like to run i like to jump you know or jog i shouldn't over, over, <laughs> trundle, I shouldn't over it trundle um, yeah <laughs> yeah and so that's my i guess my exercise and my you know just disconnect for a period of time you leave the phone at home yes. and you go for a yeah. run and so setting parameters you disconnect, yeah you disconnect yeah. for a while and it's great we've got a local mob here in big park we catch up and go for a run and it's brilliant uh, but also uh, I've tried to be fairly disciplined around my weekends. I've got two young daughters, and I, you know, I'm I'm very rarely home during the week. So you know, I try and maintain that discipline in mind. Yeah. I make sure I'm the one taking them to their sport and hanging out and just being that so, person. So you're telling me that the state treasurer during a pandemic still has time to spend with their children? Well, in fact, I had more time <laughs> because there was no sport. Powerful. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, I was sitting there and looking at each other. In fact, if anything, my kids got sick of the sight of me during the <laughs> pandemic. Um, so. Uh, you sort of just try and be as normal as you can, but it's yeah. hard, you know. My, my kids are forever making fun of me because I'm always on my phone, yeah. you know, and you've got to be aware of that because whilst they're making fun, it's also there is a message in that as yeah, well. Yeah, definitely, and I think, um, ironic coming from that generation, but um, yeah, it, 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 it's interesting that they're starting to see that parameters should be put in place. Yeah, you know, that's right. I mean, I'm always... You know, giving them grief because they're spending much too much time on their iPad. But straight <laughs> away, they'll come back. Yeah, phone, yeah, that's right. And uh, <laughs> so, yeah, hang on a minute. Uh, there's there's something going on here. So I try and get rid of the phone, and it's not easy. Well, I've got two phones. So it's not easy. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, you've got to do it sometimes. I, well, I, every person we've spoken to, whether it's um, people like Justin Langer, um, uh, Heidi Anderson, uh, all these different people that have jumped on our platform, and I've asked that same question on how they control setting parameters and having yeah. boundaries i guess more on the positive is making sure you set aside that time yeah you know for you, not just for family connection and interaction but for yourself as well oh, absolutely oh, if you don't this is i think i think if i was uh single and no kids it'd be a perfect job because you'd be out every night yeah of course you could yeah. be out at a function yeah. every night yeah um kind of paying up yeah the storm, exactly yeah. i'd be a lot bigger than i am now <laughs> yeah. but I, you could be but it's also you've got to you've sort of got to pick your times. But the, you know, I think my electorate and the broader community is really good. When I say no to an event because you know, look, I've got something on with the kids. People are like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, I think that that's been another shift I've seen. When I started as a young lawyer, um, the whole idea of openly prioritising your family time. 
particularly as a bloke, I reckon, mm. uh, at that time was it wasn't a common thing to do. Whereas now, uh, the private sector, the big companies in particular, are very good at saying, well, actually, you know, to have a good employee, you need to allow them to also value their time with their family. So things have yeah. shifted a lot in that space as well. Such positive shift. Yeah. Right? yeah. yeah. And I think um, where a lot of the feedback that we get through workplace happiness, et cetera, is that everyone talks about work-life balance, that sort of, whether yeah. it's a fallacy or whether it's yeah. a, a good concept is indifferent, but it, uh, it's almost like counterbalance is the key, mm. you know, particularly when you're so busy. It's about having that counterbalance of setting aside that time and making sure. That's right. And go do something else, you know, go fishing or go for a swim, just do something completely different. As a man, uh, as you just mentioned there before, have, what have you found difficult along the way? Let's let's go back to when it was a bit of a different culture, if you like, in a corporate sense. What's the most difficult uh, moment you faced and, and how did you sort of push through that in a professional sense? Um, I was, I mean, and this was really, uh, I guess I inherited this from my dad. You know, dad had a pretty rough childhood. Mm-hmm. It wasn't something he talked about yep. and he wasn't good at talking about those sorts of things and emotions that generation and things like that. Generally isn't my dad, really. he died um, a number of years ago now, but he was never good at that. Towards the end of his life, both my sister and I sort of, you know, niggled him a bit and tried to get a bit more information, mm. um, but it just wasn't his thing wasn't at all. So, um, and I've been like that, and I'm still like that, to be honest. Yep. Um, but what I find is having kids, um, maybe it's because they're two girls, I don't know, yeah. but, um, uh, requires you to think about how you engage with them. Mm. You know? And I said, well, I don't want them to think like I thought of my dad. He wouldn't say anything, he wouldn't tell me anything, you yeah, know? Yeah. Which, you know, I loved him deeply, but uh, I kind of think, well, you know, I didn't get a lot of out of yep. about his own thoughts on yep. those things. So I don't want to be that to my two girls. Yeah. So try to, you know, you know talk about those things and mm. whether I'm any good at it, I don't know. Um, what, what are those things? Oh, about, you know, how you're feeling and, you know, uh, you regret a decision, you, you know, mm. just even just fessing up to when you've gotten something wrong. And it must be so different when there's such a public uh, arena that you're standing in to, yeah. to make those decisions. Yeah, yeah. And I, um, I used to love the whole um, uh, public stop side of the life, you know, the media and things. Mm. I now really, um, <laughs> the media is fundamental to the job, but I find it, um, uh, it's, uh, I find that more difficult now. Funny mm. enough, the longer I'm in the job, yeah, you know, it's like that. You get better at it, but I now. Um, find myself, uh, you know, almost having to be, you know, my press sec would say this, you know, cajoled to do media. It's yep. not because I don't like the media. It's just simply, okay, you've got to, you, you know, you've got to be able to have, you've got to have something to say. Yeah. You know? Well, maybe People, uh, if you it, could have, it could have challenged you a bit more earlier, I suppose. And now when you get better, it's not as challenging. Oh, you're always, <laughs> you're always, you're always on high alert um, yes, when yeah. you do media. But it's... Um, the old gotcha moments. The stuff. public sort of side of thing is... is um, it's one that you never, oh, well, I haven't really, you don't get kind of comfortable and settled in it. Yeah. Um, so many variables, right? Yeah. And I think when I was first in it, that was the most exciting bit. Whereas now, it's really all about That's you why you finally get getting the government, <laughs> finally get to become a minister. Um, after you know, I was in opposition for a long time. And so you mm. sort of, it's all about just trying to get things done because everything takes a long time. And yep. government has a lot of processes around government, necessarily so. It's the taxpayers' money and yep. all those sorts yep. of things. So, but you're forever going, I want to get this thing done. It can be pretty made, arduous, get it yeah. happen, you know? So, and th- so that's really where all the energy goes. Yeah, yeah. And, and speaking of energy, where do you find, uh, on those days that it is a bit tougher, uh, and maybe there's something big coming up, a long, arduous piece of, of legislation to get through, whatever yeah. it might be, what do you do personally to get up and about? Do you, do you think about um, the family? Do you think about the constituents? What, what do, what yeah, do you do? Uh, or you think about, you know, trips you've got coming up. You might be going to the Kimberley or the Pilbara. Mm. And I love travelling around the state. Love it. It's it is bloody just good stuff, it? Yeah, and you get on a plane in Perth and it's and you, for two hours you disappear on a plane, you get off in a different town or a different community. 20 degrees hotter. Yeah. 20 degrees hotter. <laughs> um, but, and there's things going on that you just like, this is, suddenly you go from exhausted to just reinvigorated. Yeah. You know? I yeah. love it. Yeah, well, that's a brilliant way to think about it. And I think the, that's almost like the reasons over results kind of mantra. You know, yeah. it, it, it doesn't matter what's happening behind the scenes. The reason you go out there is, you know, meeting new people, getting to uh, obviously see those people pushing through the hardships, etc. Yeah, that's that right. That drives you. Yeah, I love that. Um, what, is ha- what does happiness mean to you as a concept? It's such a subjective term. It is, yeah. Um, happiness, uh, enth- enthusiasm, energy. Um, 
having a reason to do things, I guess. Yeah, you yeah. Know? bit of purpose. Um, yeah. yeah, a bit of purpose to your life. And uh, that's, that's really kind of the role, uh, that's what got me into public life as well. It's that you see people in, um, you know, a lot of Aboriginal people in particular in, re- in, in, in living in poverty and not having a purpose mm. because they haven't seen uh, the results of, um, you know, what, why do you need to go to school and training and get an education, those sorts of things. So you've got to give people a purpose in life. You give yeah. people a purpose, it changes everything. You know, they'll work harder, they'll, they'll strive for that job, or, um, and then that has a broader impact through the community. So happiness, and I, I suspect, flows very strongly from purpose, and I suspect mm-hmm. people who are lost without that purpose, uh, uh, you know, you, you then see um, the mental health side effects of that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, yeah, well, speaking to purpose, I mean, a lot, of, um, a lot of people that we see come through Happiness Co., either used to have one and feel guilty for not having yeah, one or yeah, maybe right. it's like a, a job loss or, or you know, the kids move out, you know, you've got all those yeah, things to, to yeah, push yeah. through. It's, it's um, I think it's about finding identity in yourself and making sure that you, you stick to that. And I've had a few, it's a good point, I've had a few friends who had kids before I did um, and they get to the point where their kids are, you know, late teens and, yep. you know, have their <laughs> yeah. own identity. Almost own anti-dependent. Yeah. yeah, and then you watch the, depend- the, sort of the parents sort of getting... Oh, Bit antsy. Yeah. Well, yeah. what happens to me now? You know, <laughs> what I was, do I do? I've spent twenty Be years you, after <laughs> you. Yeah. Uh, but you're right. You're right. It's um, <laughs> and years. I, I I have that real sense now that the window that you've got your kids at, at a lovely age is so small mm. that um, I don't want to miss that. And well, that so, speaks to you know, that uh, that time spent, doesn't it? Before yeah. you know, you be careful sure that, because it is so short. It'll go rapidly. Have they grown really quickly? Oh here? God. Yeah. It's, I can't get over it. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Are you on TikTok yet? No, no, but I do like to do TikTok dances when yes. I'm shopping with my kids just to Just to annoy them? them? Yeah, awesome. Uh, That's the best, and best answer from a dad I can hope. <laughs> um, I guess to wrap, I'd love to get a, a bit of advice um, and to hear it from you is, is, is something that I've been looking forward to. But what's the best piece of advice anyone ever gave you around, whether it's mental health, happiness, um, your culture, uh, and, and living through that, um, or success, I suppose? Yeah. Um, Diversity, and I've said this word before, is that this is the most diverse job I'll ever have. Mm. But you got to have you got to have things in your life that are different from your job. Yeah, yeah. Um, whether it's you know sport, whether it's a hobby, um, I find I've got a lot of friends who just get absorbed into their jobs, and yeah. that is their reason for being. There's got to be more to that, you know. There's got to yeah. be another reason beyond simply getting up and going to work. Yeah. Um, and so I, I always like to, you, know, you always got to have something planned, I think, you know, whether it's just a holiday to Albany or just whether it's a, um, a going for a run, you know, you've got to have something else in your daily routine. To that's, look forward to. To I look suppose. forward to, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's yeah right. it's a driver, isn't it, when you've got that target, even if it's like, you know what, if I, if I have to be away for three or four days, at least it gives me that opportunity to be, and that's gratitude, right? Yeah, yeah. that's right. So um, that's what I try to still, you got you got to mix things up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the uh, it's almost like shares, right? Or diversifying is always better. Yeah. You know, like you can't just have all your eggs Absolutely. in one basket. And it's, oh, I, you know, my in terms of my culture, it's, um, uh, that that gives me great, um, uh, I guess, intellectual and emotional nourishment is, mm. because that's still, for me, it's still a, it's still a learning curve I'm on, to trip I'm on. That yeah, I'm on. I, I, and, and not to go into to recent events, but I think it, there's there's moments where people relate that to your work, and how do you deal with that? Pressure? Yeah, and that's the, that's tough. I mean, I love uh, I've got a, a few portfolios. I have Aboriginal affairs mm. that I love, and it's got its it's got its trials and tribulations. No doubt about that. But I think that's because people have huge expectations on me and you know, my uncle Ken, um, which means that you can never live up to those expectations. It's always not. going to be crunch points of reality versus. Um, aspiration so um, inevitably you disappoint people and that's hard for me as well when you know that you've disappointed people but you know that's why you've got to kind of have a you got to lift your, your eyes a bit and yeah. out of the day to day and know where you're kind of heading uh, with, with with what you're doing in your ministerial portfolio and that's the key yeah how do you manage that disappointment like if it does come is that a hard question to answer? Yeah, it, uh, not well. It's sort of, you know, you, you ponder it and it, you stew on it. Yeah. And, you know, you toss and turn at night and you think, God damn it, you know, this, what have I done there that's wrong? Could I have done that better? But, you know, uh, you can't get obsessed by it. You've got to then get out of that and move on with, well, knowing that 
you know, overall, I think, you know, that's the key. Overall, the journey you're on is going to be uh, leave the place better than when you found it. Yeah, sort of bringing the sum and the equation together through legacy rather yeah. than just those little moments. Because yeah. Yeah, every day there'll be terrible moments and wonderful moments. That's course, the nature yeah. of it. Yeah, it's the nature of the beast. And um, I suppose when, when you think about it, uh, or what I'm thinking right now, is that ultimately people watching will think, geez, it's a human behind this role, you know, and that... That's something that people need to realise a, a lot more, I think, is... And it probably is getting a lot better with that compassion. Yeah, and, stuff and what I find with people as well, I think politicians as a group are much maligned. <laughs> um, but what? every yeah. person who's met a politician, not whether it's me or others, quite like the individual politician yeah. they meet. Yeah, meet. Yeah. Uh, but as a group, you know, oh, God, we you know, despise. But, um, but I think when you meet a politician, it doesn't matter who they are, um, and you have a conversation, you realise, oh, okay, well, this person's oh, actually just a normal yeah. human being. I think that's a lot of celebrities. In, in yeah, life, like, you know, maybe that's the case too, yeah. Yeah, uh, and, and you are a celebrity. Oh, yeah, so, absolutely. I, I know you absolutely, love Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> um, two things uh, to finish up then. If, if in an ideal world, budget wasn't an issue um, and uh, uh, any sort of hurdle wasn't an issue, what are the two things you would love to, to bring in as... Uh, legislation or Well, policy. the thing I'd love to see if I could do it overnight without any obstacle in the way would be um, a big Aboriginal cultural centre, the National Centre yeah, here in yeah, Perth. Yeah. Uh, it's the missing piece in Australia um, and it's when you travel the globe, it's one of the things that you always get people are really interested in our Aboriginal culture. Mm. Um, that would be probably fundamental um, uh, to, I think, tourism, but also our own sense of identity in Australia. That would be the thing I'd love to do. I think it would just... Um, uh, <laughs> It'd make people think about what they uh, what they think, uh, and and obviously with recent events again, it's education is the absolute key. I just remember, I, sorry, I remember not getting the education that that culture deserves yeah. as well, yeah. which I think yeah. is just that's right. Uh, I think about it, and it makes me cringe to be honest, but um, yeah, that's got to change. Yeah, and it's it is. Be, it's getting uh, way better. Yeah, it's getting way better. And the second thing, sorry, would be I spent a lot of time in very remote Western Australia, mm. um, where I love to be at the point where all those kids are uh, are spending ninety percent of their time in those schools. Yeah, yeah, they're they're not some you know, and we've got to do a lot better there. Mm. If they're the two things I could change, it'd be that. I love them. I love them as a as an ambitious goal, but you know, realistic in the future as well. Yeah, we, I, we absolutely. Both of those will eventually happen. Yeah, I was thinking more like dreamy, but I love that. <laughs> I love that it's realistic. It's always realistic. Um, ben, thanks so much for your time, mate. Uh, right, you, you're an incredible resource for us here at Happiness Co in terms of being a local member and you've just been nothing but welcoming and warm and there's no wonder that you're uh, in the position you're in and doing so well. Thanks, Robbie. Thanks, Robbie.